Hey, my name is David, and I'm one of the pastors here at Perdido Bay United Methodist Church. And this edition of our Wednesday evening programming, which you may be watching any time that uh, we post it online, and it'll be available through our website, is a Stump the Chump. We uh, have done a couple of these over the years. We usually do them at the end of our spring Bible study series as uh, you have opportunity to collect questions about any of the studies we've done or just anything that's been lingering. I've got questions here in this envelope that I have not seen, and so we are filming this unedited, and I hope it works out for me. Uh, all right. I won't be able to get to all of these. We're just going to do 30 minutes. So um, we'll see. Ooh, there's quite a few in here. We'll see what the first one is. Oh, my. Okay. <laughs> Starting off with a big one. Psalm says, God knit us, formed us in our mother's womb. And Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 29 says, All things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For who God foreknew, he predestined. So the question is specifically about Judas was predestined from birth by God for the purpose of being a tool or pawn in betraying Jesus to allow for his sacrifice any chance of repentance, question mark, and then true or false uh, is written on the question. I think there's a couple of different questions happening here. Um, I'm going to start with the one from uh, Romans chapter 8, specifically references uh, verses 28 and 29. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. I love that passage of scripture. For those whom God foreknew, God also predestined, to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. I do think, I do believe that um, Paul, when he wrote these uh, passages of scripture, meant what he said uh, when you hear someone like maybe a Wesleyan theologian like myself say, we do not believe in the doctrine of predestination. It doesn't mean we don't believe in Romans 8 verses 29 and 30. It means we believe in these verses. We just interpret them the way we believe that Paul originally intended for them uh, to be read. The doctrine of predestination was developed by theologians uh, several hundred years, more than 1,500 years after uh, the actual writing of the book of Romans. The way that it was usually translated and the way that it is most interpreted, I believe, by most Christian theologians is that God does have a destiny that he wants for all of us. And that destiny is at one moment with him or atonement with him, his heaven. I believe that is God's destiny for me and for anyone that God has created. Not all of us will be responsive to grace. Not all of us will turn in repentance and uh, experience faith in Christ that justifies us. And then uh, so on through justification, there is sanctification and eventually glorification as outlined by Paul in the book of Romans. But, but it is true that that is God's hope for all of the world, for us to respond positively to his grace. At least that's what we believe as Wesleyan theologians. So what does it mean? Does everyone have a chance for repentance? Yes, I believe everyone does have a chance for repentance. I believe that God's grace is provenient and given to all persons, and that uh, even Judas, uh, which is the specific question here, has uh, an opportunity to be repentant. Did God know Judas was going to betray Jesus? Did he foreknow that? I, I'm sure that he did. God is incredibly intelligent. He is uh, omniscient, means all-knowing. 
Does that mean that somehow Judas lost his freedom? I don't believe so. Does God know what choices that I will make in this world? I I think he does. I think he knows the good choices I'll be making, the bad choices. I think even in this moment, God knows what choices I'm making and whether or not they are for good or for evil. Uh, But do I still have freedom to make those choices? I believe so. Am I culpable for my evil, even if God already knows that I'm going to do it? Yes, I, I just believe that. Uh, An example that I oftentimes use is when I was a young boy and my parents uh, would take me down to the beach for my birthday. Uh, We, By the way, my birthday is April 2nd, coming up. Uh, And they were getting ready to take me to my birthday dinner. And they would uh, ask me a silly question like, hey, do you want to go get some uh, black eyed peas and turnip greens? And I love Southern vegetables, but we ate those a lot at my house. Or do you want to go to Billy's and get some blue crab? They knew every time, 100% of the time, I'm going to choose I want blue crab because they knew, but I still had the freedom to make that choice. I want blue crab instead of turnip greens. Well, friends, God is a lot smarter than Fred and Dale Saliba or any of us. And he knows, as he is omniscient, a choice we may make, but that doesn't mean we somehow have lost our freedom. So I do believe uh, God has foreknowledge. I do believe that we are all destined, or even as Paul writes, predestined for God's eternal kingdom. That doesn't mean we all are going to make that act of repentance and the experience Christ's justification in our lives by coming to faith in him. Uh, So I hope that answers the person's question. Oh, who made God? Uh, God, (laughs) Um, yeah, uh, who, there were no who's before there was God. Uh, God is uh, not with beginning. God has always been. Uh, We do believe God is eternal, which means uh, always has been, always will be. There is no beginning to God. There is no creation of God. There is no making of God. God is, and uh, God always will be. And uh, we don't believe God is timeless. That means he cannot enter into time. We, we do, in fact, believe God enters into time. We see that in the scriptures, but we do believe God is eternal. Uh, no beginning and no ending. Okay. Regarding the witch at Endor, oh, of course, All these questions are going to be from the Old Testament. Much better at the New Testament. Well, the first one was from Romans. Why did God allow Samuel to be conjured, even though that kind of thing is taboo? Or was it really Samuel? What is the point of that story? Um, All right. Uh, Let's see. Why did God allow Samuel to be conjured? This is regarding the witch at Endor. I'm almost certain that um, this is not actually a witch. Uh, That's at Endor. I'm not trying to say the person who wrote the question isn't right on it. Your Bible might say witch, but... um, Let's see. Oh, thanks be to God. It is 1 Samuel chapter 28. I don't know where. Thank you, Jesus. That one came to me. Um, Yeah, so in 1 Samuel chapter 28, that's not referenced here on the question, but that's where this story takes place. Uh, Saul disguises himself, and he goes to a uh, a medium. Really, I believe she's a necromancer, uh, which is a funny word to say. So I'm glad you asked the question because now I get to say necromancy, uh, which is a, uh, it is a form, I guess you would say, of witchcraft. It is uh, called, it is against the Torah law. And Saul even tried to put an end to all the necromancers uh, previously in his ministry. So, uh, but anyway, a necromancer consults the dead and conjures up spirits. I believe in this story without reading it all, uh, Saul calls through the necromancer or the witch at Endor, uh, calls upon Samuel to hear uh, another prophecy from God about how he's doing. I also, uh, I also think it's really interesting in this story, if you pay attention that the necromancer herself, near the end of the story, 
shows uh, great kindness towards Saul. Uh, he had been starving himself. He had been fasting. And I believe she was the one that cared for him and fed him. Uh, why is this in the scriptures? I would say that uh, the prophecies of Samuel were powerful. They were of God and not even human death would stop God's voice being heard in the life of Saul, the king. Um, do I believe in necromancy? N no. Um, do I think God can use all kinds of ways to speak to persons? I mean, here we are in Lent and many of us are fasting and we hear the voice of God in, in new ways. Uh, maybe that's what was at work here. But uh, the, the point, I believe, of the story is that God is still trying to correct and speak and offer wisdom to Saul, and um, that we can, again, find acts of kindness in some of the most unlikely places. And so um, that's how I'm going to interpret that scripture for a stump the chump. Maybe more to come on 1 Samuel 28 another time. At what age were you as a child that you felt God's calling on your life, and how did you respond? Huh. Um, well, I have felt God's calling on my life as a child. First, I would say everyone is called. You don't have to be an ordained pastor like myself. Uh, or paid by a church to do ministry like I am in order to be called, uh, I believe God calls all of us and at different times in our lives is calling us to different things. Uh, I, I wish I could remember the very first time I heard God's call in my life to um, a behavior or an activity or an act. I can't, I, I don't really remember a time in my life where I didn't feel God's call um, there was a time in seventh grade where I had uh, a, a, an experience in prayer with Jesus Christ that I felt was uh, transformative in my life and set me maybe on a new direction uh, to give greater devotion of myself to God. And I remember not only feeling called to have that experience and to practice a greater devotion of faith, but I also remember feeling called to share that with my friends. And I did um, in, at a youth week on a youth night. And it was a very meaningful experience for me. Um, I I like to express myself through public speaking. And um, so that was one of the times I would say as a child, I was probably 12, that I really felt like God was calling me to do something. Maybe that's a little unusual because I understand a lot of people don't feel uh, led to share their experiences with Christ in a public way or through speaking in front of a, of a large crowd. Um, the call that I felt to ordain ministry happened over many years and had lots of different unique and interesting uh, spots along the way. But I would say even uh, just this week, I've heard God's calling to do specific things with specific people and to lead in specific ways. So um, I, I think that uh, God's always calling all of us. Other than in Genesis 21.6, when Sarah laughed upon hearing the news of her pregnancy at age 90, where else is laughter documented in the Bible? Everyone seems so serious all the time. Smiley face. Um, <laughs> uh, well, if, if, if this is written by someone who has been in worship with me much, you know that I... Uh, love laughter. And even when I can't make people laugh, I certainly try to all the time. And um, I include laughter in almost every preaching and teaching moment that I've uh, given. Everyone seems so serious all the time in the Bible uh, is part of this question. Y yes, I mean, that goes without saying. I'm trying to think the, the Greek, the New Testament I don't believe uses the word laughter very much, but there I can think the, really the only time I can think about uh, the word being used in the New Testament is when Luke gives us the um, 
what we oftentimes call uh, the Beatitudes. Let's see. Uh, He says in Luke chapter 6, verse 21, this would be B. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. And I I think because the word is used there by Jesus and um, according to the gospel of Luke, that's a sign that what will be part of the blessed life one day is laughter. So I believe heaven will be filled with laughter and that God's intention for all, especially those who weep, is that we are moved to laughter. And so I'd say probably my favorite example of laughter in the scriptures is Luke chapter 6, verse uh, 21. And um, I, can, I can think of times, you know, uh, in the Bible where it's used der- derisively, where uh, people uh, maybe mock at or laugh at uh, persons who are trying to live righteously or maybe even at God. And also times in the Old Testament where laughter is part of the blessing. But this is the, this is the example from the New Testament that comes to my mind that I like probably the most. What's the difference between an apostle and a disciple? Uh, An apostle is someone who not only follows Christ and his way and his truth and his life, but also was present with uh, Jesus himself, the incarnate version of uh, Jesus himself. And so one of those uh, 12 apostles were the first disciples who actually were with him as he was incarnate in the world. Uh, We believe Paul was an apostle because Jesus is, well, according to Paul, he's an apostle because uh, Jesus uh, appeared to him in his vision. A disciple is anyone who follows Jesus, the way, the truth, and life, his way, um, ever. I'm a disciple. You're a disciple. Uh, I wouldn't call myself an apostle because I wasn't actually with the incarnate uh, Jesus Christ. Do I have to go to church to be a Christian? (laughs) Uh, Well, I probably would have answered this question differently uh, before the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, Yeah, I think so. I mean, and I'm not just saying that because I (laughs) enjoy my job security. I, I do believe that the way God intended us to live in this world is through koinonia. I think that If we believe that scripture speaks truth to our lives, then we find there God forming his church, a fellowship of disciples who met regularly together for the breaking of bread and for the teaching and for the preaching and for the Holy Spirit to be upon them and to use them and to move them out into the world. And so um, I don't believe you can just be a Christian on an island all by yourself. One of my favorite examples of, um, of uh, uh, a conversion experience from a person who was a Christian but was adamant that they would never be in a church to being a Christian who was part of a church uh, comes from a, an old story out of Chicago and D.L. Moody, who was sitting down with a Chicago businessman at his fireplace and trying to ask him to to take part in Christian worship and become part of the faith community at Moody's church. And the man said he can do everything that he's asked to do by Jesus Christ and not be part of a church. He doesn't understand why it's necessary. And so uh, Moody got up from his seat and took the prongs by the fireplace and grabbed one of the burning coals out of the fireplace and brought it out and placed it by itself, sat back down, and the two men watched it smolder and eventually um, turn uh, totally black and, and no fire burning at all, whereas all the other coals gathered together were burning brightly. And the man said, I see. You see, we we just believe there's power uh, when we gather together and when we are who God has called us to be, which is a a blessed community, um, a a table fellowship. And uh, I do think that it's important. I pray fervently for the day when we can all be incarnational in our fellowship. And that's why I'm doing this experience even right now, so that you can take part in your church even virtually, I don't think it's as good, but um, I do think it's one way in which right now we can be present and at one with one another as God has called us to be. In Psalm 119, there are headings with names throughout stating 
know, starting with verses 1 through 8, then verses 9 through 16, and then 10 through 24, et cetera. I'm assuming because there's not, that uh, the, the question is just why are there headings in Psalm 119? <laughs> of course, my Bible doesn't have headings in Psalm 119. Hmm. Um, all right, you've listed them. How that demo? Oh, uh, okay. Well, the 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 question says in Psalm 119 there are headings with names throughout, starting with Alf. And then verses 1 through 8, that verses 9 through 16, Gimel verses 10 through 24, et cetera. Mine doesn't have headings, although it is broken up 1 through 8 and then 9 through 16. But I know these words are the first three letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And so my guess would be if I went through Psalm 119, it would be divided up uh, into 22 different sections, and your Bible would have a different uh, letter of the Hebrew alphabet, since these are the first three letters of the Hebrew alphabet uh, in front of each of those 22 sections. One of the reasons, well, poetry did this, it, it, also the, the first uh, word of each section would have been uh, following the that um, alphabetic acrostic, um, and it was a way to help memorize the scriptures and to use them in worship. And so, um, if yours has those headings, that's nice because you can learn the twenty-two letters of the Hebrew alphabet. I bet by looking at the headings. Hope that answers your question. Why don't we follow the Old Testament? Do we believe the Old Testament is divinely inspired? Uh, we do believe the Old Testament is divinely inspired. Yes, there are some laws of the Old Covenant that we um, don't follow. I, I, we believe the Bible is the full expression of the Word of God and is necessary for us to know all of that we can and to continue to work with and struggle with interpreting the Scriptures to understand our better relationship with God, with one another, uh, with His Holy Word. The Old Testament is also really the expression of the Old Covenants that gives birth to the New Covenant and... Um, I think we do follow the Old Testament in that uh, Christ is the fulfillment of the Old Covenant. And these covenants made with uh, Noah and with Abraham and with uh, Moses and with David, the, these covenants are fulfilled in the person of Christ, understood Jesus and the new covenant or new Testament. By the way, it's the same word. Uh, Kanye Diethke is, is, uh, um, is only really understood in light of an expression of the Old Testament. Uh, many of the, the laws that we don't like, kosher laws, for instance, uh, that, that we do not follow are ways in which we have interpreted the scriptures to best follow uh, God's teaching. And uh, there are many uh, specifics given to the, the people of God at a certain time in a certain place uh, that we no longer feel are applicable uh, to us. We do believe that Jesus's teachings have priority and they're applicable to all people in all times. And, uh, and so those are the ones that we concentrate on as he helps us better understand the motivation or um, the spirit of the law. Genesis chapter six through nine, when we were studying this, Levi stressed that we no longer make blood sacrifices or drink blood. Then why do we drink Jesus's blood during communion? Hmm. Well, we don't. Um, I, uh, <laughs> Um, we, we don't believe in transubstantiation, which is a Christian belief that the actual substance of the bread and wine is changed into the body and blood of Jesus. In fact, our book of discipline, our doctrinal standards say that transubstantiation is repugnant 
to uh, the word of God, to holy writ, to scripture, and that uh, we take the bread and the cup in a heavenly or spiritual manner, meaning that it is not um, actually changed into the blood of Christ, but in a heavenly and spiritual way represents the body and blood of Christ. And we do believe that uh, Christ has offered himself for us, and that's why uh, we experience this representation, this act of grace every time we take Holy Communion as a symbol and as a remembrance of what Christ has done for us as he laid down his life for us. Was Luke one of Jesus's apostles? No, um, Luke's gospel and the book of Acts, which Luke wrote, um, does not, it, it doesn't, he does not claim to be an apostle. Um, most people, I think Arrhenius of Lyon was the first to um, work this out in, in the world of Christian history and Christian thought. Uh, most believe that the, the author of Luke and Acts was Paul's companion, Luke. And uh, we know a lot about him and he was a friend and a disciple uh, he was a disciple of Jesus and a friend of, uh, of the Apostle Paul and uh, presumably other apostles, but there is no claim that he makes that, um, that he was one of the apostles. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, why do we say, Our Father which art in heaven, instead of Our Father who art in heaven? Um, well, we, we don't. Um, we say, our Father who art in heaven. I mean, the, the um, word which is assigned to usually things, and the word who is um, assigned to persons. Of course, we don't believe the triune God is a person per se, um, but God um, I think what you may be referring to is in several of the song settings, um, uh, there's a really famous uh, setting of the Lord's Prayer that was composed and written in 1981 um, that's used a lot in worship services, especially weddings or funerals. It, it does use the, the word which. Um, I, don't, I don't know why the song does that. Maybe it has something to do with singing the word which instead of the word who. Um, of course, God is something beyond being a human being, so I don't really take offense that they would use the word which, but um, it, when we say the Lord's Prayer at this church, uh, we, we use the, the word um, who um, instead of which. Um, I grew up Catholic, and we read from the book of Sirach, uh, why do we not believe this book is part of the Bible in the Protestant church. There are several deuterocanonical writings. Uh, Sirach, I believe, is um, Ecclesiasticus. Um, the Wisdom of, the ben, of ben of Sirach. I think Sirach is probably a Greek or Latin translation of the word Sirach. Um, we don't use the book of Sirach as part of the um, canon or the official uh, 66 books of the Bible. Uh, the, the reason why we don't is because the, the Jewish population did not consider it canon. And so the Reformed Church also did not consider it canon because they did not have um, it in the original Hebrew. I, I do believe, I'd have to look this up, um, I do believe that uh, in the 1900s, we have been able to, through Masada and Cairo and Qumran, piece together uh, old um, versions, Hebrew versions before 400 um, of Sirach. And, uh, but at the time that the scriptures were being canonized, uh, it wasn't in Hebrew form. It was considered to be a... Um, a work of the Greek culture and not of the Hebrew people. And so the Protestant church does not consider it part of the canon or the, the holy word of God. That's a really good question. I, I, I probably, because I'm a Protestant theologian, I, I know a little bit less about Sirach uh, than others might. All right. 
We've gone for 30 minutes. Should I answer one more? Okay, I'm going to answer one more. Uh, it's just me and Holly in this big room. And also, to save money, we don't have the air on. So if I'm sweating, it's not because of your questions. It's because it is really hot under these lights. Uh, my question is not why not everyone, um, but instead why me? Uh, this is printed out from their email. Uh, why would God choose me? I look at my life and see many failures in God's eyes, ones I would tell no one. It seems arrogant for me to look at my unspeakable past life and proclaim that I am part of the elect. I love Christ, and I do see such a difference in my life and mine since I was saved just a few short years ago. Praise God that you uh, feel an assurance of your salvation. We are all sinners. That is true. I am a sinner. Likewise, uh, I've done nothing to deserve God's grace. None of us have, even though I am told we are saved by grace and not our own works. My question is, why me? Well, God is love and God loves us all. And um, God wants all people. I mean, it goes back to the very first question. Uh, God wants us all to be at one with him. And I believe we can best find um, our at one moment by searching the scriptures and through the disciplines of the faith and uh, the saving work of Jesus Christ be justified. And God does, I believe, want that for all of his creation. Um, it's so interesting that you ask the question, why me, about your salvation? Because as a pastor, I usually hear the question, why me, because of some suffering or sadness that a person is going through, and they want to know why uh, this evil is, is at place in their life, and we do know that we've been given freedom, and the world's been given freedom, and we're in a fallen world that is not fully at one with the kingdom of God, but God wants that for all of us. God wants to save and to heal and to forgive and... Um, to be at one with all of his creation. And why you? Because you are worthy and you are sacred and you are uh, full of worth and value to our living God who wants you to know salvation. God's peace.